a little bit. It's a different color shirt. It's okay. It's still me. Um, today we are doing Napoleon's Marshals Part 3. Um, I've already released Part 1. I've got Part 2 done. Um, and this one is going to get done today. Today's Thursday, so Part 2 and 3 will be up tomorrow. Um, I apologize. I'm getting a lot of requests, and I'm not able to keep up with them. So, uh, I, I would you two stop? I get on my phone. I see the request on on my YouTube analytics thing, and then I lose them, and it's hard for me to now keep up with them. So, if you've requested something, I do apologize. Request it again, just in case I haven't. You know, I might have given you a thumbs up and said I'll check it out, but I haven't been able to write it down. I was at work or or whatever. So I, I do apologize. Uh, Alexander the Great, I know, was mentioned. And if I don't put your name on there, there was just a lot of names listed, and, and I do apologize for that. I try to keep up and try to give the, the props to the people who ask for things. But um, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and open up a classic cola. Today was a good day. Today was a good day. Nice day at work. We're going to open up a cola and we're going to go ahead and get into this video and um, and then we'll watch it together. We'll learn. Terror Belly, and I still Decus think Pacis. This is a cool thing. Terror in War, Ornament in Peace. It's just such a cool thing. The words inscribed on every French Marshal's baton. In France, the title of Marshal or Maréchal goes back at least to the 13th century. Maréchal. It represents the highest possible position of military authority. Authority symbolised by a Marshal's baton. The title was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. But in 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. This is Epic History TV's guide to Napoleon's marshals. I just realized he had his foot on a on a drum. All 26 have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as marshals. I love that painting. With expert guidance from Lieutenant Colonel Remy Porte, former chief historian of the French army. So far We've met Marshals Perignon. Um, any of these Marshals that are going to be listed, or in, listed so far, or any that have been, any of the Marshals at all, did any of them write a book about their time under Napoleon or with him? Just kind of like, um, like a re, you know, the reflections of their time in the military and da da da. I'm curious to know if they did, and if they, if they did, what their thoughts of him were after his, I'll say expulsion, but that's not right. Was that right? Expulsion? That's more school. I almost said deportation. Anyways, what their opinion would, would have been of him after. Maybe it'll get into it, I don't know. Brune, Serrouillet, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monsey, Poniatowski, Jordan, Bernadotte, Augereau, Lefebvre, Mortier, and Marmont. First, a big thanks to our video sponsor, Blinkist. Thank you, Blinkist. Blinkist is here to help solve a big problem for many of us. So many books. Sincere. He is the best man among us. He is the best man among us in the line of defense, though I am superior to him in attack. Okay. Gouvion Sancerre was a gifted student who ran away from a miserable childhood to become an artist. A passionate Republican, he embraced the French Revolution and later volunteered for military service. Though proud and aloof by nature, his Republican politics and sharp intellect ensured he was elected captain of his company. His skill at drawing enemy positions then got him noticed by General Coustine who gave him a job on his staff. During these turbulent early years of the revolution, Custine was one of several generals who was punished for defeat, 
with a trip to the guillotine. Wow. Sancerre's instinctive grasp of war. Did that guy really screw up like a lot, or was he just a somebody who screwed up and Napoleon hated him? Seems like Warfare, an awful, brilliant planning and tactics won him promotion from volunteer to general of division in two years. An even more remarkable achievement, as he'd had no formal military training. Wow. But his cold, analytical approach meant that he was always a respected leader, rather than loved. After five years' service with the Army of the Rhine, he was sent to Italy. At the disastrous Battle of Novi, he commanded the French right wing, but skillfully extricated his troops from the debacle. The next year he was back on the Rhine, and won a brilliant victory over the Austrians at Bibrach. But a bitter dispute with his commander, General Moreau, encouraged rumours that Sancerre was impossible to work with. Sancerre believed soldiers should not meddle in politics, and did not support Napoleon's seizure of power in 1799. Nor did he show much enthusiasm for Napoleon's decision to crown himself Emperor five years later. His political views cost him dearly. Sancerre was sidelined for several years, while less able generals were made marshals. In 1805 he commanded French forces in central Italy. But when he was made subordinate to Marshal Massena, a man whom he personally detested, he returned to Paris, even when Napoleon threatened to have him shot for desertion. In 1808, Sancerre was given command of a corps for the invasion of Spain, but his failure to take Girona meant he was relieved of command. Leaving in a fury before his replacement, Marshal Augereau, had arrived, he was nearly court-martialed again for desertion. Sancerre's military talent, however, was not in doubt. In 1812, he was recalled for the Russia campaign, with command of 6th Bavarian Corps. His role was to support Marshal Oudinot in guarding the northern flank of the French salient. When Wittgenstein's Russians attacked at Polotsk, Oudinot was wounded, and Sancerre took over command, turning probable defeat into a brilliant victory. For this achievement, Napoleon awarded Sancerre his Marshal's baton. But two months later, at a second Battle of Polotsk, Sancerre was attacked by a larger Russian army seriously wounded in the foot and forced to pull back. His injury meant he missed the worst horrors of the Russian retreat, but he contracted typhus early in 1813 and was sick for many months. Sancerre returned to the Grande Armée in August, taking command of 14th Corps and the defence of Dresden. Incredibly, this was the first and only time that he worked directly alongside the Emperor and both soon learned new respect for each other's abilities. Sancerre's skilled defence of Dresden set the stage for Napoleon's great victory there later that month. But Sancerre was incredulous when Napoleon later ordered him to remain in Dresden, while other forces concentrated for the decisive Battle of Leipzig, 60 miles to the west. Napoleon's defeat at Leipzig meant that Sancerre and other garrisons in the east were cut off and had to surrender that autumn. Sancerre took no part in the Hundred Days, determined to keep out of France's political disputes. Under the restored monarchy, he served as Minister of War and tried, but failed, to save Marshal Ney from the death penalty. He also struggled to enact military reforms in the face of royalist opposition, eventually resigning in disgust and retiring to his country estate. That was a beautiful home. Marshal Sancerre remains one of the great what-ifs of the Napoleonic Wars. An extremely able commander sidelined for his politics, who might well have proved one of Napoleon's very best marshals. 12. Hmm. Marshal Udino. I know the name. <laughs> Nicolas Udino ran away to join the army aged 17. 
but his father dragged him home three years later to help run the family business. I, I apologize. I was laughing at the comment that was there that said, a brilliant fellow but not very bright, something like that. <laughs> I just, I didn't get to pause it in time. When the revolution began, he volunteered for the National Guard and was promoted to Major. In the wars that followed, he served with the Army of the Rhine, always in the thick of the fighting, rapidly promoted and frequently wounded, a habit for which he became celebrated. In 1799, he was promoted to General of the... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I want to make sure I heard that right. Him being wounded? I'm sorry. Army of the Rhine, always in the thick of the fighting, rapidly promoted and frequently wounded, a habit for which he became celebrated. Jesus. In 1799, he was okay. promoted to General of Division and sent to Switzerland to serve as General Massena's new Chief of Staff, a role he performed to perfection. Serving with General Brun in Italy, he led a cavalry charge against an Austrian battery at the Battle of Monzimbano, sabering gunners and capturing one cannon himself, a feat for which Napoleon awarded him a sword of honour. In 1805, the newly crowned Emperor Napoleon gave Oudinot command of an elite grenadier division formed from the tallest, strongest soldiers in the army. In December that year, at the Battle of Austerlitz, Oudinot insisted on le Um... Grenadiers. Um... I know the name, but I don't know what that means. Would that be... Uh, <clears throat> Panda, this is for you, or anyone who would know. Would that be like uh, the US Marines, or would it be like uh, Army Rangers, Navy SEALs? Like what would be, because I've heard the name, so what would what would they be equated to? N not necessarily now, but uh, what would they be equated to that I would understand? Oh, okay, that's he, he was leading a skilled set of the Army, or the Marines. I've heard him, I've heard Grenadier before, but I don't know what the, how to compare it to, to completely understand what it would be. But I mean, it was an elite squad. I'm going to say it's probably like Army Ranger, Navy SEAL, Delta Force, kind of one of those elite units. Right or wrong, I don't know. Leading the division in person, despite having been shot in the thigh two weeks earlier. His grenadiers were kept in reserve for most of the battle, but saw heavy fighting in the latter stages, as Napoleon completed the destruction of the Allied left wing. At the Siege of Danzig in 1807, General Oudinot's division had the unusual distinction of capturing an enemy warship, a British sloop that had run aground trying to resupply the city. Oh, that sucks. A month later, at Friedland, Oudinot and his grenadiers were under Marshal Land's command and played a crucial role holding up the Russian army. Until Napoleon arrived to deal a decisive blow. During the 1809 war with Austria, Oudinot was wounded once more at the Battle of Aspern. When Marshal Land died of his wounds. How many times was Oudinot injured? And was him being injured, that he was celebrated, so it was not like a good sign, like when he was injured, that, that meant they were going to win? Or was it just like, oh, hey, look, he got shot in the ass again, congratulations. Like, <laughs> Napoleon chose Oudinot to succeed him as commander of 2nd Corps. He led his new corps with such success at Wagram six weeks later, that Napoleon attributed victory to Massena and Oudinot. A week later, he became one of three new marshals. One for France, one for the army, okay. one for friendship. Oudinot, the army's choice. Fearless and much loved. A man whose courage inspired all around him. He later received an additional reward, the title Duke of Reggio. Army, then I'm going to guess army rangers, but um, as a, for the grenadier comparison. I'm going to say Army Rangers, but that just, I'm guessing you call all military more or less Army, just the, the Army, get them out. I don't know. 
I don't know if it's translating. In right. 1812, Marshal Oudinot led 2nd Corps into Russia, but was wounded again at Polotsk, and handed over command to General Saint-Cyr. Ten weeks later, he was back with his corps, marching south to join up with Napoleon's army on its retreat from Moscow. Like my Oudinot's men were shocked when they... I apologize for the glitching. It's just... Oh, that's a beautiful painting. I'm sure I've said that before. Uh, my fiber optics every now and then just kind of glitches. And just... Not glitches, but it slows. So I'm just trying to kind of let it buffer. You you understand. You've seen... Saw their old comrades from the main column. They looked more like fugitives than soldiers of the Grande Armée. Since Oudinot's second corps was in better shape than most, it formed the vanguard for the desperate crossing of the Berezina River. But the next day, in bitter fighting to hold the bridgehead against the Russians, Oudinot was shot from his saddle. Of course he, was. he was carried back to a cottage with a serious gunshot wound, but then he and his party became surrounded by Cossacks. Oudinot asked for his pistols, and from his bed, aiming through an opening opposite, began firing at the Cossacks. <laughs> They were rescued by friendly troops, just in time. Wow. Oudinot was back with the Grande Armée in Germany in 1813. In August, Napoleon ordered him to lead an advance on Berlin. But he was defeated by Bernadotte's Army of the North at Grossbeeren. He then retreated in the wrong direction, causing Napoleon to remark, it's truly difficult to have less brains than the Duke of Reggio. In Udino's defence, he'd probably been given an impossible task. Insufficient men to take on a strong opponent, bad weather, terrible roads, and he himself unwell, possibly not yet recovered from his... I'm just going to throw this out there. Maybe he was retreating the wrong way, yes, but maybe he was retreating in the only way, the only viable route, instead of trying to cross through a muddy pass, or trying to... Just getting uh, yeah going the wrong way but going on a road where he had access to that actually was sufficient to get the hell out of there and then from there if they got a good distance then they could kind of veer off into circling around to maybe going where they are i'm just giving an excuse i understand but i'm just trying to i'm trying to help the guy out because apparently he gets shot all the goddamn time ordeal in russia Napoleon put Oudinot back where he was most effective, leading troops in combat under his close supervision. At Leipzig, he commanded two divisions of the Young Guard, engaged in heavy fighting on the southern front for two days. Oudinot continued to serve the Emperor courageously and loyally as a corps commander in the final campaign of 1814. But in April, he was one of several marshals to confront Napoleon with the reality of his position, and force his abdication. When Napoleon returned from exile in 1815, Oudinot refused to break his new oath to the monarchy, but declared neutrality, telling Napoleon, since I shall not serve you, sire, I shall serve no one. He continued to hold senior commands under the Bourbons. By one estimate, Oudinot was wounded 36 times in his military career, more than any other marshal. Here are just 20 that we found details for. A fellow officer who bathed with him at a spa after the war saw the scars on his body and observed he was little more than a colander. 36 wounds? He was little more than a colander. That is a that is a great description. Thirty six wounds. I don't know how the, I don't know the proper way to salute that gentleman, but if I ever visit France one day, sir, I want to visit your grave. Just for the fact that you, you lived through so I mean just Wow. And he died, I see, of natural causes, aged 80 in Paris. Sir, I want to go to your grave. 
It's not like you did anything to stand out to make me think, but just to, I just want to go there and just stop people and go, do you know this guy got shot 36 times? I would lie too. I'd make up stories like, hey, shot right through the penis. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Just, I'd just make things up. 36 wounds. Oh, I am... Wow. That's all I can say to that. Wow. Ironically, Boudinot was also one of the longest-lived marshals, dying aged 80 while serving as governor of Les Invalides. And he probably died because he, like, sneezed too hard. Like, something ridiculous. He sneezed too hard and gave himself a stroke. Something ridiculous. First impressions mean a lot, like hell? when you hire someone new. The Bamboo HR Definitive Guide to Onboarding shows you how to get it right. Okay. Sorry. 11. Marshal Victor. Is that a good thing or Claude a bad thing? Victor Perrin was an experienced soldier by the time of the French Revolution. A sergeant so with eight bad. years service in the Grenoble Artillery Regiment. Every single one of these, I apologize. The first thing I look at is the background, and then I look to see when they died. <laughs> and then I skim over the major battles. But it's like I look at the top and then the bottom. I just want to know where they came from and how long did they live. Sorry. <laughs> the Revolutionary Wars brought the opportunity for rapid promotion. And by 1793, he was commanding an infantry battalion at the Siege of Toulon. He led a daring night assault on British defences, alongside the army's artillery chief, a young Major Bonaparte. Both men were wounded, but the attack was a success. This was when Bonaparte was a... I'm going to say a cannon. He was involved with the cannons, but that's, that's a terrible way to word it. I don't remember the, the correct wording of it. But you, you know what I'm saying. So these two, he wasn't, Napoleon wasn't Napoleon that he became, he, what did I just say? Napoleon wasn't the Napoleon that we all know him as. Something like that. Okay. And both were quickly promoted to Brigadier General. Wow. Victor served under General Bonaparte in Italy and turned out to be a brilliant brigade commander. So these two had history. In 1800, he distinguished himself at the Battle of Marengo, where his command of the left wing won particular praise from Napoleon. But Victor Sorry. did not hide his disapproval of Napoleon's quest for political power, and as a result, received relatively minor roles under the new regime. In 1802, he was earmarked to lead an expedition to recover the French territory of Louisiana. But it was called off when Napoleon decided instead to sell Louisiana to the United States. Victor and Marshal Lann were close friends from their days serving together. Um, was he looking forward to going to Louisiana? Or was it just kind of... I'm pointing you and then he undercut it by just selling it because they needed the money. I don't know. In Italy. In 1806, Lan persuaded Napoleon to let him have Victor as his new chief of staff for Fifth Corps. Napoleon agreed, and in October, Victor served as Lan's deputy at the Battle of Jena. Napoleon's earlier misgivings about Victor were now forgotten. And that winter, he was given command of the newly formed 10th Corps. But within weeks, he was captured by a Prussian patrol, and had to be exchanged for a captured Prussian officer, General von Blücher. His big break came in 1807, stepping in for the wounded Marshal Bernadotte to command 1st Corps at Friedland, where he successfully led a major attack as the Emperor looked on. Promotion to Marshal, and the title Duke of Bellumo, swiftly followed. In 1808, Marshal Victor and First Corps took part in the invasion of Spain, where he'd be posted for the next three years. 
Victor's record in Spain was better than most, but like others he seemed more interested in personal glory and rewards than in cooperating with fellow commanders. In 1809 at Medellin he inflicted a crushing defeat on General Cuesta's Spanish army. Okay, so there's a Medellin, Spain, which makes sense because there's a Medellin, Colombia, and Spain did go to Colombia. I didn't know there was a Medellin, Spain. Obviously, I mean, I, I know about Medellin, Colombia because Medellin is where um, Pablo Escobar and his cocaine fame. Um, wow, I didn't know Medellin, Spain. Wow, that's pretty cool. Sorry, that was just a side note for, for me. Four months later, his bold night attack on the British at Talavera came tantalizingly close to success. He was furious the next day when King Joseph and Marshal Jourdain refused to support fresh attacks and instead ordered a cautious withdrawal. The next year, Victor besieged the Spanish port of Cadiz. It proved a lengthy, futile operation, devoid of glory, and saw his troops defeated by an Allied sortie at the Battle of Barossa. In 1812, Victor was recalled from Spain for the invasion of Russia. His Ninth Corps was held in reserve for most of the campaign, though his troops were kept busy defending depots and convoys from Cossack raids. That autumn, uh, just a quick refresher, the Cossacks were Russian, correct? And they were pretty, I don't want to say brutal, but they were, they were pretty good fighters and they could be brutal. I'm just a quick refresher. His corps attempted to cover the main army's retreat from Moscow. The greatest crisis of the retreat came at the Berezina River. As the remnants of the Grande Armée began crossing over two improvised bridges, Victor's IX Corps was ordered to form the rearguard. Though heavily outnumbered, Victor skillfully handled his French and German troops, holding the Russians at bay as the army made its escape. He then marched his surviving troops over the bridges in good order. A courageous performance in desperate circumstances. In Germany in 1813, Victor commanded 2nd Corps and led the attack in Napoleon's last great victory at Dresden. His corps was in heavy fighting again at Leipzig two months later. Victor continued to serve at the Emperor's side in the defence of France in 1814. By now, like many comrades, he must have been close to physical and psychological exhaustion. Regardless, during the Battle of Montereau, Napoleon let fly at him for failing to get his troops into position, and blamed him for the Allies' escape. Victor was relieved of command, but angry and humiliated at what he considered his unfair dismissal, he told the Emperor, Marshal Victor has not forgotten his old trade. I will shoulder a musket and take my place in the guard. Moved by this response, Napoleon relented and gave Victor command of a corps of young guard. Two weeks later he was badly wounded at the Battle of Craon and took no further part in the war. A month later Napoleon abdicated, and Victor switched his loyalty to the Bourbon monarchy, with surprising zeal. He led an investigation into former comrades who'd supported Napoleon during the Hundred Days, and was one of only two active marshals to vote for the death penalty for Marshal Ney, a decision he later claimed to regret. Victor later served as Minister of War, but retired from public life in 1830, following the overthrow of the Bourbon monarchy. 10. Marshal Murat I cannot conceive how so brave a man could be so unreliable. He was only brave when facing the enemy, in council he was a fool with no judgment. You know, so far, 
was it 26 they started out with so these 16 guys I don't see very many high marks from Napoleon on a lot of these people was was Napoleon just a very I don't uh, like a self-centered person who believed that if he dished out too much of a compliment that person was going to somehow rise above him or were these people just really not as as good or was he just Napoleon just kind of a dick overall that's the feeling I'm getting is he's just kind of a dick kind of guy and he didn't want to give you too much praise because he didn't want you to get a big ego Joachim Mira, the son of an innkeeper, was destined for a career in the church, but dropped out of college and joined a cavalry regiment instead. To his immense frustration, he saw little action in the early years of the Revolutionary Wars, being stuck with staff and training roles. But in 1795, while stationed in Paris with the 21st Chasseurs, fate intervened. A young general, Napoleon Bonaparte, had been put in charge of the defence of the National Convention. With a mob poised to storm the building, he ordered Captain Murat to bring him cannons, which he did, racing the guns through the city streets, allowing Napoleon to mow down the mob with a famous whiff of grape shot. Napoleon was hailed as the saviour of the government and rewarded with command of the Army of Italy. Murat was promoted colonel and went with him as his new aide-de-camp. He soon made a name for himself as a bold and brilliant leader of cavalry. While his six-foot height, curly locks and love of women ensured fame as France's foremost beau sabreur. Dashing swordsman. In 1798, Murat joined Napoleon's expedition to Egypt. At the Battle of Aboukir, his flanking charge broke the enemy, and Murat personally took the Ottoman commander prisoner, despite being shot in the jaw, a wound which, to his immense relief, did not ruin his looks. Back in Paris, Napoleon launched his coup d'etat to seize political power. When he got a hostile reception from the Council of 500, it was Murat who saved the day leading troops in to clear the chamber, shouting, Citizens, you have been dissolved, before adding something a bit more coarse. His place at the future Emperor's side was further assured when he married Napoleon's youngest sister, Caroline, in 1800. Later that year, he commanded the French cavalry... Re are there any... And I'm sure there are... Are there any Napoleon uh, descendants alive today that are well known or anything like that? Or are they just kind of like living in the shadows, doing their own thing? The fact that they're related to them is just kind of like, eh. You know, they're not bragging about it or anything like that. <coughs> Excuse me. And how is Napoleon viewed today? Is he thought of as a good thing, a bad thing? Curious. ...reserve at Marengo, and helped Napoleon to win a decisive victory over the Austrians. When Napoleon established his empire in 1804, Murat became a marshal, second in seniority only to Berthier. He'd later also received the title Prince of the Empire, and the rank of Grand Admiral. In the 1805 campaign, he commanded Napoleon's cavalry reserve, his excellent reconnaissance and diversions proving crucial in the encirclement of General Mack's Austrian army at Ulm. Three weeks later, Murat and Marshal Lannes, who normally couldn't stand each other, together bluffed an Austrian commander into surrendering a vital bridge by persuading him that an armistice had been signed when it hadn't. It was a bold stunt, but overall Napoleon was not impressed by Murat's pursuit of the enemy. I cannot approve your manner of march. You go on like a stunned fool, taking not the least notice of my orders. Yet in battle, Murat remained a brilliant and inspiring leader. 
as demonstrated at Austerlitz, and the next year at Jena, where he led the decisive charge, wielding only his riding crop. The next year, at Eylau, with the Russians poised to break through his centre, Napoleon ordered Murat to lead a mass cavalry charge straight at the enemy. Murat's men succeeded and saved the army from disaster, though at a terrible price in men and horses. Napoleon had rewarded Murat in 1806 by making him sovereign prince of the Grand Duchy of Berg. In 1808 he sent Murat to Spain to act as his representative. Spain was still a French ally, but in May Napoleon's heavy-handed meddling in Spanish affairs triggered a ferocious backlash. Madrid rose up against the French garrison, and Murat's troops fought back with brutal force, killing around 200, executing 300 more. When Napoleon deposed Spain's Bourbon monarchy, Murat hoped he'd be made the new King of Spain. But that title went to Napoleon's brother, Joseph. Murat instead received the throne of Naples. If it felt like second prize, it wasn't bad going for an innkeeper's son, college dropout, and ex-cavalry trooper. Yeah, I guess you just kind of looking at your background, figuring what you would expect. Yeah, you got passed over for the brother, but you, it's a shitty thing. But yeah, it kind of happened a lot, but you still got recognition. You watching the video, Maiden? Your sister's snoring. Yeah, he's still got something out of it, so I guess he can't be too mad. Napoleon expected Murat to merely represent his interests in Naples, but Murat had other ideas. He reformed the Neapolitan army, equipping it with splendid new uniforms, and turned a blind eye to smuggling, which undermined Napoleon's economic war against Britain, the so-called continental system. Relations between Murat and the Emperor became strained. But when Napoleon began planning to invade Russia in 1812, only Murat would do to lead his cavalry. Their differences were put to one side. Murat took command of four cavalry corps and became Napoleon's second in command. During the advance into Russia, Murat's cavalry faced a difficult and frustrating task trying to locate the enemy in a vast landscape. Horses died in their thousands from poor fodder and exhaustion, and they faced a dangerous and wily opponent in Russia's Cossacks. Murat, always riding with the advance guard, was so fearless and conspicuous in his extravagant uniforms that the Cossacks came to admire him, calling out, Ura, Murat, whenever they saw him and hoped to capture him alive if possible. Murat was among those who tried to persuade Napoleon to halt the advance at Smolensk, but was ignored. At the great clash between the French and Russian armies at Borodino, Murat was at his best, directing a series of attacks on the Russian earthworks, always where the action was hottest, inspiring all with his courage. Murat remained with the army during the retreat from Moscow, though his magnificent cavalry had virtually ceased to exist. One eyewitness noted that throughout the ordeal, he never neglected his appearance. Even at the Beretsina he looked splendid, in an open-necked shirt, velvet cloak, a white feather in his cap. When Napoleon left the army to return to Paris, he gave command to Marshal Murat. But Murat, now primarily concerned with hanging on to his kingdom, left the army a month later and returned to Naples, where he opened secret negotiations with the coalition. He offered to join the war against Napoleon, if the other powers would let him keep his crown. But he received only a lukewarm response. So in 1813, when Napoleon asked Murat to join him in Germany, to fight for their thrones together, he answered the call. Murat had become increasingly difficult to work with, 
oversensitive about his royal status, prone to tantrums, but in battle as fearless as ever. Really seems to be a guy who kind of goes with the breeze, right? A lot of Napoleon is the is the man, and he's fighting wars, and we're winning. All right, I'll stick with you. Napoleon is is losing, and a lot of countries are coming together. And yeah, I'll stick with you guys. You guys, you know, no. Napoleon's got a charge, and like the guy really just kind of sways with the breeze. And I can't fault him for that. He's going whichever side is going to win, and he's going to stick with that side. It's kind of a dick move, but you know. Got to do what you can to survive. At Dresden, his charge through rain and mud shattered the Austrian left wing and paved the way for victory. But then, at Liebert Volkwitz, he showed his limitations when not under Napoleon's direct command, getting drawn into a major and unnecessary cavalry battle with coalition forces, and twice nearly being captured himself. Two days later, at the Battle of Leipzig, he led another of history's great cavalry charges, coming close to breaking the enemy centre, and even capturing the Allied monarchs. But it was not to be. The Battle of the Nations ended in a disastrous defeat. As Napoleon retreated to the French frontier, Murat informed the Emperor that he was leaving for Naples, promising to raise fresh troops. Murat and Napoleon would never meet again. Three months later, the King of Naples had cut a deal with the coalition and switched sides. I remember so that, long okay. as it was possible for me to believe that the Emperor Napoleon was fighting to bring peace and glory to France, I fought loyally at his side, Murat declared. But now I know that the Emperor's sole desire is war. However, Murat's commitment to the Sixth Coalition was distinctly half-hearted. His army marched against Eugène's forces in northern Italy, but had done no actual fighting before news arrived of Napoleon's abdication. Murat then began to suspect what had been obvious to Napoleon at least. The Coalition was not going to honour its promise, and Murat would be next to lose his throne. So, in 1815, Encouraged by news of Napoleon's return from exile, Murat marched north against the Austrians, proclaiming a war for Italian freedom and independence. Just seven weeks later, his campaign ended. So he figured they're not going to allow me to keep my throne. So he first he turned against France and be, his king in Naples turned against France and sided with the Allies, and now he's turned against the Allies just on the his own thought that they're not going to let him. No proof to back it up. Maybe he was right to 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 do it to to believe that they wouldn't have. But he had no proof of that. He just flipped. It's like. Why, man? At least, if they would have charged in and said, like the Allies, everything's calm and suddenly the Allies charge in and you're like, uh-oh, this was a bad decision. But they wouldn't have killed you. They might have kicked you out of being a, a king somewhere, but you could have went back to Paris and you still lived okay or, or well, I don't know if you could have went, well, no, you, yeah, you probably could have been welcomed back into Paris. But to have just flipped again, like that's just stupid. Just In so defeat dumb. at the Battle of Tolentino. With the British and Austrians closing in, Murat became a hunted fugitive. He sailed to France, but Napoleon had not forgiven his betrayal and refused to see him. After Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, he fled to Corsica, gathered a small band of volunteers and returned to Italy in a hopelessly doomed attempt to start a revolution and reclaim his throne. What's this dude doing? Chased by a mob and arrested on the beach, Murat was sentenced to death by the restored Bourbon monarchy of Naples. 
he met his end with his usual courage, telling the firing squad, if you wish to spare me, aim at the heart, then gave the order to fire himself. Murat is rightly remembered as one of the great battlefield cavalry commanders of history. Inspirational, fearless, with brilliant tactical instinct. But outside of combat, he was, in Napoleon's estimation, a very poor general. He always waged war without maps. Worse, when the conflict turned against France, he allowed self-interest and vanity to prevail over loyalty to the Emperor. As Napoleon's Chief of Staff, Marshal Berthier, once told him, you're only a king by the grace of Napoleon and French blood. It's black ingratitude that's blinding you. Sancerre, Oudinot, Victor, Murat. 17 down, 9 to go. Join wow. us for part 4. This is good. This is good. I still can't get it, and I'm going to butcher the name. Udino, number 12, Udino. What a, what a man. I get a splinter and I'm just like, okay, hold on. We all, the world has to stop while I get this splinter out. The man was shot 36 times. Not necessarily shot, but he was wounded 36 times. Just think how that feels. You got shot with a musket ball just one time. I mean, what the damage that it could do inside. And that man had 36 different wounds. Wow. That man... If I told you... Hey, I want to shoot you with a musket... If this thing worked, and I wanted to shoot you with a musket pistol... Just to see what would happen, right? I'm going to shoot you in the hand... You might be like, no, but let's just, you were like, okay, that's fine. And then what if right after that I said, okay, but I'm also going to shoot you 35 other times throughout your body with the attempt to kill you. We'll just see what happens. How many of those do you think it would take? It's just, it's just crazy. I can't get over that. I'm, I'm going to end the video here because the video is over. I'm gonna end it here. I'm gonna go get some dinner, and I'm just gonna think. <laughs> Thirty-six wounds. I see why they celebrated him. Oh, he got shot again. Oh yeah, yeah. No, he was supposed to. It's all he does. He was just a magnet for for shrapnel and bullets. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> it's, it's like he had a flag that was just designated. Like I'm on the battlefield and I'm ready to get shot again. And how long do you think he was down for each time he was wounded? couple months three six months he was back on it I, I'm curious to know when his first wound was to what his last wound was 36 wounds he didn't have time to recover Wow, this is crazy well I'm gonna end it here and I'm gonna I think I'm this is number three and I think there were six of them maybe seven six of them for sure so i'm gonna guess i'm gonna guess six and then the next three 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 so i'm gonna end this one here <laughs> who'd know you just impressed the shit out of me all right i'm gonna end this here like and subscribe if you haven't do it if you have do it again and have a good day, have a good night.